scripture reading this morning will be from 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on a fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker seed or weaker vessel, and as being heirs together as the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. You may be seated. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to be together, and we are thankful for the presence of everyone. And if you have never been here before to worship with us, we are honored that you have come, and we hope that you'll come back at every opportunity to worship with us here at the South Trail Church of Christ. Heard about a man that uh, his first visit to the psychiatrist, he just kind of opened up and he told him, he said, you know, doctor, he said, I am tired of being on the outside looking in. The doctor kind of smiled and he said, well, it sounds like we've got to do a lot of work to build up your self-image. He said, but let's get some facts first. He said, uh, what do you do for a living? The man looked at him and said, I'm a commercial window washer. All right, I thought I had, in my head I saw that going better than, than it did. I want to talk about the biblical key to marriage. And, of course, we think about love, but what is love? Saying love is not showing love. Let me give you some definitions of love from some children. Rebecca, age eight, said, When my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails, so my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Billy, age four, said, When someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You know that your name is safe in their mouth. Little Carl, age five, said, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> Chrissy, age six, said, love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. Danny, age seven, said, love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure the taste is okay. Bobby, age seven, said, Love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening, opening presents and listen. Noel, age seven, Love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. <laughs> Tommy, age six, Love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. <laughs> Elaine, age five, love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. Lauren, age five, I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> love is important, it's a key in our relationships, but we have to understand what love is. I want to talk about a subject this morning that is a key in marriage, but it's also a key in every relationship. On one occasion, Jesus was approached by two of his disciples. They were brothers, James and John. In Matthew chapter 20, we have this account. James and John wanted the best seats. They wanted to sit at the left and the right hand of Jesus 
And Jesus looked at them, he said, those are not mine to give, but my father. He said, now, listen to me, though. He said, in the Gentiles, you know how they lord it over one another? And they want that authority over one another? He said, but it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great, let him become your servant. If I were to say to you what today's lesson is all about, what Peter is trying to get across about marriage, that's the critical element, is that every one of us realizes that being in submission begins with God. And once we put ourselves to become the servant of others, every relationship begins to come into focus. And there's not the same spirit of, of lording it over or trying to compete what we realize is that God has set things in a place. God has set an order, and when we trust God, we trust the roles, the responsibilities that God has given to us. I want you to look at 1 Peter with me. If you go back to chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter talks about what we share in Christ, and he talks about the fact that we have been born again to a living hope that we have received an inheritance, incorruptible and, and, and undefiled, reserved in heaven. He comes down in chapter 1 to verses 10 and 12, 10 through 12, and he talks about what was going on in the Old Testament, that the prophets were foretelling about what was going to happen. And the key of that in verse 11 is the sufferings and the glories of Christ. And even the angels didn't always understand. They, they desire to seek, to look into what God was doing in this plan of salvation. And then in verses 15 and 16, the centerpiece of this is to become holy. The world says, be happy. God says, be holy. If you find holiness, you can receive happiness. If you look for happiness, you'll, number one, never find holiness, and you will probably never really be happy. Holiness allows us to have a relationship with God. And so there, in verses 18 to 20, he talks about this redemption, that God paid this price in the blood of Christ. And in verse 22, he says, So love one another sincerely, the kind of love that God has first demonstrated, the kind of love that God has shown us, and that's what's proclaimed there in verses 23 to 25 in the Word of God. In chapter 2, in verses 1 through 10, he's telling us that we need to be the house of God. We are children of God, citizens of God. We are priests, royal priesthood. And we proclaim in verse 9 the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 2, we abstain from the fleshly lust. In chapter 2, in verse 21, we follow in the steps of Jesus. You ever heard that book by Charles Sheldon? In his steps. That's what it means. What would Jesus do? The question comes from that book. It's the idea that we want to be more like Jesus every day. In our thoughts, in our intentions, in our words, and in our actions. Being like Jesus. Look back at chapter 2, verse 13. He says, therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. The submission to the laws of the land, to the leaders that we have, and he says whether the king or whether governors, but they have a place. They serve a purpose, and you submit to them. Do you remember who was the Caesar during the time of Peter's writing? Nero. Not a nice fellow. A genuine narcissist. Somebody who was probably just so wrapped up in himself that he was absolutely afraid of everybody and exercise his, his power as a tyrant. And Peter says, whether to the king or to the governors who serve the king, you submit to the laws. Look in verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. Again, for the same reason, because you love the Lord, because you honor him. Were all of the masters good to their slaves? You know the answer. No. And yet Peter says, be submissive to your masters. And then he comes down in chapter 3. And again, sometimes we look at chapter 3 and we take it out of context. And, and sometimes we balk at what Peter says because he says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. 
when you realize what Peter has already said about being good citizens and obeying the laws of the land, about being good servants or slaves even to their masters, being good employees, what we understand is what Peter says, it's not out of character. What we see is in the home, it's just like every other relationship. There is a submission to God, and therefore we see that what God has designed, it's not perfect in the sense that I'm always going to receive the kind of treatment that I desire, but what God says is there is an order, and you have a place, and if you do your best in that place, God will reward you. You will be holy. You can be someone who is living out your life in the image of God. You are recognizing God's preeminence. You ever heard somebody say, God is good? Sometimes people will say all the time, God is so good all the time. God's intent, what God has intended in marriage, is something that is absolutely for our good. It's just like every other area of life, though. If you live by the world's rules, you can expect the world's results. How about if we try to live by God's rules, and maybe we expect God's results? Anybody, anybody say that sounds good? All right, let's live by God's rules and let's expect God's results for him to bless us and bring about the kind of oneness in marriage, the kind of beauty in relationship that he desires because he wants a relationship with you. And marriage was intended to reflect the intimacy, the communion, the closeness that you and I have with God. Here in chapter 3, as Don read for us, and, and, and I was asked by Don's wife, we, we don't have to say Eleanor's name, do we? Okay. To not look at her while Don was reading this. She asked Don not to look at her. While, I don't know. That's just between them. But you, we'll, we'll come back and talk about that later. All right. I understand. The couples, we have so many wonderful examples of couples that have been married 30, 40, 50, 60. We have a couple of couples that are getting close to 70 years of marriage. You, know, you can say it. Wow. What an example. What a powerful example for us. Look what he says in verse 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct by their wives. Do you see what's overriding in the relationship, even in marriage? The soul, the salvation of every person. What Peter says is, what's most important, whether you're a citizen, whether you're a servant, whether you are a wife, is the soul of the person that you are seeking to save. And if our lives ever become a stumbling block, if we ever get in the way of anyone, whether it's our children, whether it's young people in the church, whether it's a brother or sister or someone outside of Christ, shame on us. Our lives need to reflect the love of God so that it draws other people to see the purity, the simplicity, the power. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. All right? To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Understand, we're trying to save souls. We're letting the Word of God dwell in us, show through us in such a way that other people can find their relationship with God based on His powerful Word. And marriage is no different. It serves the purpose that God has. We're talking about a spiritual order, not superiority. The man is not the, the dictator, he's not the Lord, he's not a tyrant. But wives are submissive because God has given them a certain role. Roles carry responsibilities. How many of y'all got married at a shotgun wedding? Okay, I was hoping nobody raised their hand. Okay, If you did, I, I apologize. I did not mean to single you out. Okay, You choose to get married. You choose whether to have children. Now that choice is a big decision. We try to impress upon young people how important becoming a spouse is. Whether it's a husband or wife, and that's based on gender, and yes, we still believe in the male, the female gender that God created. That's how it was in the beginning, and guess what? As far as I know in biology, it hasn't changed. Male and female. And in that, we have certain roles, and those roles carry responsibilities, and you exercise choices whether you become a husband or a wife, whether you become a, a father or a mother. And you need to weigh those choices before all of a sudden you say, well, I didn't know what I was getting into. 
Well, now you're in it. Now your choice is to fulfill the relationship. Without order brings chaos. Chaos prevails. Do we see chaos evidenced in the world that we live in when crime is rampant? When people are living out addictions to drugs and alcohol uh, and other things, when people get caught up in those kind of behaviors, we see the evidence of chaos. God wants to bring order. He wants to bring us back to a place where we can receive His gifts, His goodness, His grace. That comes from certain social conventions in our world as well. That authority brings order. Back in Genesis, when God says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Jesus, in Matthew 19, he says, Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And then Jesus says in Matthew 19, 6, What God has joined together, let no man separate order. What God has intended for husbands and wives is to bring order. And the children receive all the blessings. We see divided homes. We see the effects of divorce in our society. And it's painful. It's hurtful on so many different levels that I can't even really get started except to say that that's chaos. That's not the result of what God intended. What we need to do is recognize and honor God and say, God, what you had in mind, that's best. That is absolutely the ideal. And if we can practice the kind of respect for each other, recognizing those roles, recognizing those responsibilities, then we're going to have the mutuality that God intended. God intended for us. One lady, they had reached their golden anniversary, their 50th wedding anniversary, and somebody asked the the wife, they said, what was the, the key? And she said, well, on our wedding day, I made a decision. I made a decision that I was going to overlook his Top 10 faults. 1 through 10, I was just going to make a list and I was going to overlook his top 10 faults. Okay? Somebody may be thinking, my list is a lot longer than 10. (laughs) All right? I will tell you, women, we are easy targets. You can make a lot longer list probably for most of us. She said, I'm going to forgive his top 10 faults. And and so the guests inquired, said, "Well, well, you know, can I ask what that list was? She said, well, every time he did something that made me hopping mad, I just said, well, lucky for him, that's on that list. She said, I never wrote down the list. The list was flexible, but understand her forgiveness, that was the power. That is love. To be able to say, you know what? He's not perfect, but guess what? I'm not perfect. If we recognize our own imperfections, we're going to go a lot further to being able to forgive and to be able to understand the other person's faults. Bill and Kristen Bresnan in New Jersey are a wonderful example. They've been married over 40 years. And guys, i got to tell you, Bill Bresnan puts us all to shame. Bill Bresnan decided at the beginning of their marriage that he was going to write a love letter to his wife every day of their marriage. And he has done that for over 40 years over 10,000 letters that they keep in 25 boxes and growing, all of those organized by date, 10,000 plus. Now here's the key too. It's not just that he writes those love letters. They enjoy being together. There's a good idea. Enjoy being together. They enjoy simple things like playing games. They play like boggle games for two. I know Larry and Carla Failing play a lot of bananagrams, all right? Ask Larry who wins. It's good for his ego. It's humbling for his ego, I should say. They enjoy candlelight dinners. Bill and Kristen Bresnan, just just having a simple, it doesn't matter. It can be bologna and cheese, but they're eating it by candlelight. They're doing that together. Do you see the picture? You know, showing this kind of love for each other, practicing this kind of submissive relationship because it's mutual. It's reciprocal. It blesses both. This is because what Peter said back in chapter 2 and verse 17 is it's because of the fear of God. So we honor all people. We love the brotherhood. We practice this love in our relationships. We practice this love at home. Somebody has said charity begins at home. I'm going to tell you that service begins at home. 
When Jesus says, whoever desires to become great among you, let him become your servant, take that principle home. Put that principle into practice in your relationship. So many times we get our, our feathers ruffled and then we say, well, if she'll go first. Or if he'll go first. You know, I can remember at home when my parents, my sister and I would fight. I know that surprises everybody. My sister and I would have some disagreement and then my parents would say, okay, say you're sorry. And we'd look at each other and it'd be like, you know, you go first. You know my parents had the audacity because I was older. They expected me to go first. I'm telling you, that still, still doesn't sit well. <laughs> go first. Go first. You need to go first. There are things that we need to say. You know what love looks like, what, what submission looks like? Have you ever heard the phrase, there's only so much air in the room? If one person takes up too much of the air, there's not enough for the other. It says the two shall become one. That doesn't mean that one ceases to exist. It means their lives are so wrapped, bound by the love that they share that they become mutually blessing to each other. If we respect each other, we're going to practice communication, consideration, compromise. You say, well, what does compromise look like? Let me ask you a question. What matters more to you, money or your mate? What matters more to you, time or your mate? What matters more to you, your job or your mate? Your hobby or your mate? When we value the other person, we are going to put those things above. Gary Chapman has written a book called The Five Love Languages, and he talks about five ways of expressing that love. Words of affirmation, talks about uh, quality time, talks about receiving gifts, acts of service, and then physical touch. It's a great book. I encourage it. I give it to young couples when I do premarital counseling. Those five things, just think about how your spouse receives love and communicate it in the way that they can receive it. It will be a blessing. Look at what Peter goes on. He's talked about the outward adornment. He says, let it be the hidden person. He goes, this is precious in the sight of God. It's the inner person, gentle and quiet spirit. The gentle means meek. That means under control. It's not talking about not strong. But it's a matter of saying, I'm going to use this strength in a correct way and being quiet, knowing how to remain at peace, knowing how to remain silent at times so it doesn't further the argument, it doesn't repeat the process, expecting somehow to change the results. If we practice the world's rules, we're going to expect the world's results. And then he says in verse 6, 5 and 6, For in this manner in former times the holy women who trusted in God... So many times we just kind of read right past that and we say, Sarah called Abraham in verse 6, Lord. Do you understand why Sarah did that? Do you realize what Abraham came home and he told Sarah? He said, Sarah, we got to pack up. She's at an age where she says, now? And she's probably thinking, you know, if I ever do have kids, mom and dad are right over the hill, over in the next tent. I mean, how convenient is that? We've got built-in babysitting. Pack up and move. I don't think so, Abraham. We've been here a long time. No, Sarah trusted God. They get up to the, the, the land, and, and then later, you know, she's told now she's approaching 90 and 89 years old, and she's going to have a child. She laughs. Understand, over and over in their lives, she trusted God. Can you imagine Abraham coming to Sarah and saying, God told me to take Isaac up on this mountain, and I'm going to offer him as a sacrifice? You may say, well, Abraham would have been better not to tell Sarah that one. Sarah trusted in God. She had a, a husband who's known as the father of the faithful, a friend of God. That's who Abraham was. But Sarah trusted in God. And so she respected her husband. What we see there in verse 6 is Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and not afraid with any terror. In other words, folks, we need to put our trust in God. Put your trust in God. Adorn yourself with the submission that is trust in God. Peter tells us over in Acts chapter 5, when he's talking to the Sanhedrin, he says, well, here's where the line is. We must obey God rather than men. When the law tells us to do something that's in direct violation with God's will, we have to say no. And in our homes, if somebody says we're going to do something that's in violation of God's will, we have to say no. We have to put our trust in God. What was the point of marriage? 
You remember what God said in Genesis 2.18? It's not good for Adam to be bored. No. It's not good for man to be alone. So he brings a helper, comparable to him, to bless him so that they can work in this reciprocal relationship together. He gave man responsibilities to tend and keep the garden. I will tell you that your calling, your vocation, is to take care of your marriage. You need a gardening project? How about nurturing and nourishing the relationship with your spouse? Make that your call. Make that your project. Love must be practiced. Then verse 7. And it's a little shorter to the men, so we'll just take a second here. No. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life. You remember what we said back in verse 1? What was the overriding principle? Salvation. Fellow heirs of the grace of life. When you look at your spouse, men, when you look at your wife as husband, she is a fellow heir of the grace of life. She is someone that Jesus died to save. Jesus died to save. How much value does that place on how you look at your wife? If Christ died to save her, she meant that much to him? We're told, Paul says over in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Oh, there's no end. That, that's the kind of love that goes to the absolute, gives and lays down your own life for your spouse. To love her as Christ loved the church. Fellow heirs of grace. What a beautiful, wonderful thing. He says, dwell with them with understanding, knowing their affection, knowing what is necessary. In the summer of 2015, out in California, there was a teenage couple that was struck by lightning. They were able to avoid any serious injury. You know why? Because when they were struck, they were holding hands. It diffused the electricity through both of their bodies and neither one of them took the brunt of the harm that could have been what that bolt of electricity could have done. When we're holding hands, the relationship diffuses some of the hardships of life. It gives us balance. Two are better than one. We're better together than we could ever be alone. There is something that we need to hold on to. Notice what Peter says, that your prayers may not be hindered. This is not the only place. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 through 9, Paul talks about the, the relationship, and the physical relationship is connected to the spiritual there. He even says, you know, don't deprive one another unless it's by mutual consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. The spiritual can override the physical, but there is a responsibility. There's something there that, that affects. Jesus said on one time, he said, if you come to the altar to bring your gift, and there you remember that your brother has something against you? What did Jesus say to do? He said, you leave your gift at the altar and you go first and be reconciled. There in Matthew 5, 23 to 26, first be reconciled to your brother. And then you come and offer your gift. Our relationships affect our worship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I appreciated Merritt reading that today to remind us as we observe the Lord's Supper... But going a little further, what Paul says, if you eat the bread and drink the cup in an unworthy manner, if you do not discern, if you do not examine yourself, he said, then you eat and drink judgment to yourself. Now that unworthy manner, it's not how we eat the bread or drink the cup. It's not the way you hold it. It's the life that you've lived. It's have you come into the worship honoring God and recognizing I'm a sinner. I need, God, I want forgiveness. God, I want my relationships to be more like what you want them to be. I can't eat the Lord's Supper, the bread and the cup, and then go back out and, and just trash my home and trash the relationship. There is something there that I must discern. It's got to have a changing, transforming, elevating power in my life. What I tell couples is, if you're both getting closer to God, you're getting closer to each other. The principle works. Our prayers are hindered where we don't consider, we think that somehow, well, God and I are, are, are buddies and nothing else matters. No, everything matters. 
God sees it all. God knows it all. He knows the depth of your heart. What Paul says is, I want to present you like a chaste virgin, the church, to Christ. There in 2 Corinthians 11 too, we talk about there in Ephesians 5, the relationship of husbands and wives. He says that's like Christ in the church. You've got to reverence. You've got to respect. If you don't reverence Christ, you're going to treat the, the church and, and the worship. You're going to treat the, the relationships disrespectfully. Ah, but if you see what the picture is, that marriage is a reflection of what God desires with each one of us, then you're going to honor your marriage. If I were to give some simple instructions to both husbands and wives, put God first. Build your relationship on trust. Love unconditionally. It, It isn't rocket science, but it's a matter of trying to see where you have those rough spots. Like I said... There's only so much air in the room. In in our case, that means I have to let Gwen speak once in a while. It's too easy for us to have relationships that do not honor God. Show your love. Don't just say it. Oh, say it, but make sure you show it. Make sure that you're willing to serve do you realize that this, submissive, this submission principle, is, it's not in one area of life. It's not just in the home. It goes out into every relationship. Our submission, any of us who want to be great, we've got to serve. And if you recognize that we are servants to God, we are debtors to God, it'll go a long way toward keeping your relationships in their proper perspective. William Gladstone went to the House of Commons to tell, to announce about the death of Princess Alice. He told a story there. He said the doctors, when Alice's little girl had diphtheria, the doctors told Princess Alice, they said, don't kiss her. If you breathe the same air, you're liable to contract the same disease. On one occasion, the daughter was coughing, and the mother just instinctively did what any mother would do. She held her in her arms to help keep her from choking, and the little girl, being there, being held by her mother, looked up and she said, Mama, kiss me. You know what she did. She kissed her. And in doing so, she breathed the air, and she contracted diphtheria. But the reason that she got that was because the love that she was showing to her little girl. If we show the love that God wants us to show, oh, there are things that we may risk, but I will tell you the rewards are so much greater. The rewards are so much greater. Today, I hope that you recognize that the biblical key to marriage is to follow God's rules, not the world's rules. Practice love, practice submission, practice trust in God. If anyone here today, you realize you've never obeyed the gospel, you realize that this picture of marriage, this intimacy, the type of relationship is exactly what God wants with you. But you, because you have wandered away from God by your sin, you need to come home. You need to come to Him on His terms Come on your knees, putting your faith in Christ, repenting of your sins, making that confession that Jesus did die in your place and be buried with him in the waters of baptism. The beauty of the picture of baptism is that it is the same picture of death and burial and resurrection that Jesus suffered for us. If today you realize as a Christian that your life hasn't honored the kind of principle of submission or practice of love that you know God wants, then make that right in your life. If you want the encouragement, if you want brothers and sisters to pray with you, we would love to be able to pray with you this morning that God make your home, that God help you to be all that God wants you to be. If we can help you in any way, just step down to the front. Come to the front right now while we stand and while we sing.